Hello, 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 and welcome back to today's podcast. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, you guys, I am so excited. So I learned about our guest just a few months ago, and I have been doing nothing but talking about demography since. So we are going to talk about that today. If you don't know what demography is, it is basically the study of people, births and deaths and demographics. I'm going to make it simple. Ken Gronbach is a demographer. He is an author and a speaker. Ken has written a couple of books, most recent being The Upside, Profit from a Profound Demographic Shifts Ahead. And so he has predicted many things to happen just based on demographics such as the 0809 housing crisis, market falls, and presidential elections. So I'm going to introduce you to Ken, but keep in mind as we go through this today, Ken is a macro. He's at the macro level, not the micro level of, hey, this is what's happening in farming and ranching and blue collar jobs. He's a big picture guy. So keep that in mind as you're questioning, well, how does that affect us? How does that affect us? Well, you might have to do a little more research. But the big picture is kind of really what we need to look at. So. With that, thank you, Ken, very much for being here. I appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Love it. I love to talk. Oh, to I'm just so fascinated. From North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's in America, and right? If <laughs> you know what, that's actually really funny that you say that because it is amazing how many people say South Dakota. I'm like, nope, North Dakota. We are one step further north to Canada. And nobody knows who we are or where we are. It's in some sense, it's kind of nice <laughs> because we have a really small state. But in other senses, as me listening to your book, Upside, I'm like, um, um, uh, we're not going to have anybody here pretty soon because <laughs> everybody is <laughs> leaving and going to Florida. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all right. Well, so I'm not going to, Ken, I don't want to get into like the big history of how how you got started and, and kind of that whole thing because you have been interviewed on so many podcasts and so many other platforms that if people want to hear that, I think they can just go listen to those podcasts. Um, but I really, you have so much information that I kind of want to get into the meat and potatoes of it right away if you're okay with that. Sure, do it. Okay, so let's start with population numbers because this really is what is driving a lot of the demographics. So can you tell us a little bit about the number of millennials versus baby boomers versus Gen X? Sure. The population of the United States is about 330 million. Now, now I, I say about, and, and that's because we deal with the U.S. Census and the U.S. Census um, uh, it does approximations. And for some reason, I, and I don't know why, I really don't. I think it might have something to do with COVID. Uh, the, the 2020 census, uh, there's still information from the 2020 census that, that's not out yet, that we don't have yet, which is kind of weird. So it? all of it or just some of it? Uh, just some of it. It's coming out it's, okay. it's coming out in bits and pieces. But let me tell you how this works. Between 1905 and 1924, we had a, a, a huge population born in the United States of about 56 million people, and that was huge. That's 1905 to 1924. We also, at that point, had about 14 million people that came here from Europe. So that created a population of about 70 million people. Baby boomers' parents. The generation born 1925 to 1944 was called the silent generation. There's about 50 million of them. Compared to the generation that they followed, uh, the, the generation they followed was 70 million, the GI generation. So the silent generation is small. The generation that was precipitated by the GI generation born 1905 to 1924 was called baby boomers, and they were born 1945 to 1964, a huge generation of about 78 million. And I think with some immigration, they, the, the, the end number was about 80 million. Keep in mind that the silent generation born 1925 to 1944 didn't have any immigration. The, uh, it, for one thing, um, the majority of the people or, or the largest group of immigrants in the United States are Germans. And we have about 70 million people of German descent. During World War II, a lot of them thought Hitler had something going for him and went back. 
they actually went back. And, and that was a problem for us in, in World War II. But the, the baby boomers born 1945 to 1964, 80 million are, at the time, was the largest generation ever born in the United States, totally. A monster generation, and they drove everything. They drove consumption. They drove farming because they ate food. They drove clothing. They drove houses. They drove cars. They, everything everything that, that a generation could possibly consume, the baby boomers consumed. Now, following the baby boomers are the kids of the silent generation. Remember, the silent generation is small, 50 million. So the silent generation was born 1965 to uh, 1984, and there were only 69 million of them. There were actually uh, about 10 or 11 million fewer of them than baby boomers. So it's a, we have a hole in our population right now that's currently uh, like 38 to 57 years old. It's, it's physically a hole in our population. And the difference between the baby boomers, and this, and this is what drives everything right now, because the two previous generations that I mentioned, the GI generation and the silent generation, we can put them aside because uh, one is dead and one is small. <laughs> but the generation that uh, are uh, uh, right now that is supplying us with labor, because the baby boomers are leaving the labor force at about you know, four or five million people per year, which is a huge number. The generation that's supplying us with labor is the generation born 1965 to 1984, uh, Generation X, and it's too small. It can't do it. And so it's creating all kinds of issue for labor. In addition to that, um, Generation X, because it was small and because the baby boomers demanded labor and, and Generation X could not supply it, that sucked in uh, Latinos, mostly Mexicans, and it sucked them in by the tens of millions. Literally, and it's wonderful because I, I, I tell folks you got a problem with Latinos, and I know farmers couldn't possibly have a problem with Latinos because I don't th I don't think they could do anything without Latinos. But I say go find a Latino, kiss them on the lips, and thank them for coming, because without Latinos we don't have a, we don't have a country in 2050 because we don't have enough people, we don't have enough labor, we don't have enough taxpayers, we don't have enough anything, and Latinos are a wonderful uh, generation. They fit right into our culture. They're Catholics. Uh, they're family oriented. We're blessed by them. We really are. And I'm, and I'm not. And I'm saying that from from uh, kind of a calculating position. The generation after Generation X is Generation Y millennials. Those are the baby boomer kids. There's 88 million of them. Now, granted, there's a substantial number of them that are a product of the Latinos that came here as immigrants, but. The, we have a crop of kids right now that are 18 to 37 years old that makes us the envy of the rest of the world because the rest of the world does not have a substantial generation in that age. So are this generation you, is amazing. Can I, stop, can I stop you for one sec? Are you putting all, so you're saying millennials are 18 to 37. Because here's the thing that I've heard you talk about in other podcasts and stuff I've listened to, is nobody has an exact age group <laughs> on millennials. And so when I look online, I'm showing like 27 to 42 for millennials. What is yeah. the actual age group block that would match every other generation? Well, let me put it to you this way. You wanna understand this? Do you wanna understand demography? Okay, okay, of course you do, or you, we wouldn't be having this discussion. If you want to carve up generations and have some generations be 13 years long and some generations be 19 years long and some generations be 25 years long, you will never understand. You just simply won't. A generation, it, it, it's true. It, it, what we do is, is we go by census data. It's, it's old, it's archaic, it's uh, anachronistic in a lot of ways, but a generation is 20 years long. And if you don't understand that a generation is 20 years long, and, and essentially what that used to mean was that from the time you were born to the time that you started reproducing and having your own kids. Based on census data, the accepted norm for, for baby boomers was 45 to 64, 1945 to 1964. So we, as an organization, KGC Direct, that does uh, demographic research, 
We use 20 year generations going back and we use 20 year generations going forward. So we say that the, the uh, Generation Y millennials were born 1985 to 2004, an exact 20 year generation. And that's how you can compare them to the 20 year generation before them and the 20 year generation before them. And when you put that in chart form, you will find that it works out perfectly. Okay. Baby boomers is a big bell-shaped curve. Okay, the next generation that's small is an inverted bell-shaped curve. The next generation, millennials, is a big bell-shaped curve. Now, it so happens that going forward, Generation Z, born uh, 2005 to 24, not fully born yet, is going to be another very, very big generation, bigger than the baby boomers, not as big as the, as the millennials, though. So. We have so much going for us as a nation based on demography. We have a monster generation of retirees that are not fully retired called baby boomers. We have a, a substantial generation called Generation X that is augmented by tens of millions of Latinos that are advancing very nicely and consuming very nicely and being part of our labor force very well. In fact, I live in South Florida. I don't know, I don't think anything could function down here without Latinos. The next generation, we're the, and, and, and we're the only industrialized nation, the only world power that has a Generation Y millennial uh, group at 88 million, which is a significantly bigger than the generation that, that it follows. Are, are they going to be our labor? Well, yeah, unless they're going to go to another planet. I don't know. Of course they're going to. Are they growing up late? They'll tell you this. I'm not in psychographics. I don't pretend to understand the psychology of the generations. I do to some degree. But Generation Y millennials have stretched out uh, adolescence to 30 years old. They have. They're marrying late. They're entering the labor force late. They're having their kids late. They're buying their houses late. They're doing everything late. But are they going to do it? Yes, they're going to do it. And so we, where are and they now? Wonderful that's my question. Well, I think we go to the we go to the restaurant and we don't have help. We go to the checkout lane and we don't have help. So where where are they? What are they doing? What are they doing? <laughs> we, they stretched out. They stretched out adolescence until thirty years old. I think their parents are finally going to kick them out. They're going to throw away all those trophies they didn't deserve. They're going to become adults. And you know how I know that that's true? Because I grew up in hippie culture. I was never a hippie myself. But you know what a hippie is, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. You've heard that yeah. expression. <laughs> Okay, the, the hippies were extreme left wing. The hippies were calling for a revolution. The hippies were, you know, battling police and, and don't trust anyone over 30. What happened to the hippies? They amassed wealth, they grew up, and they became Republicans. And that's what's going to happen is millennials are going to grow up. They're going to have to feed themselves. They're going to have to provide their own shelter. They're going to have to feed their kids, and they're going to have to take life seriously. So. Do they exist? Yes. Are they 88 million strong? Yes. Have we seen them overwhelm the labor force yet? No. Are they going to overwhelm the labor force? Yes. So do you think that they're I, not moving out because we have the shortage of housing for them? Because I've heard you say, too, we're 2.5 million homes short. It's actually more than oh. that. This is this, this is this is what I believe happened. And, 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 and I'm a baby boomer. I don't believe, and, and the data shows that baby boomers are not prepared to retire, about half of them. Some are, some are not. I happen to live in South Florida where everybody's prepared to retire. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's weird. I mean, everybody drives, the, the mayor drives a Ferrari. Uh, baby boomers stayed in the labor force longer than they should have, and, and for two reasons. One, because they could, because they're healthier than the generation in front of them. They have much better health care. Baby boomers do not have dying on their punch list. Baby boomers will live probably, a substantial portion of them will live into their 90s, not into their 60s, like their parents. So that's that's one factor. So they're they're leaving the labor force, and they're leaving the labor force, and, and it, there's, a, there's a suddenness to it because of COVID, because they said, man, I'm I'm going to start enjoying life. I'm not living like this anymore. So we have this short-term problem, and it is short-term, Mary Jo, because 
Generation Y millennials are going to enter the labor force and we're going to have all the labor we ever needed. And it's going to be high level labor, good labor, solid labor. Don't worry about it. That is interesting because now we're seeing none. But it does make sense. If you look at I, 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 if you look at the gener your twenty year gap versus what everybody else is saying, but they don't have like we don't have before we got on, we were talking about housing in oil country for us. But housing here in in the middle of the state where it's not directly we get we get some offshoots of oil country because we're kind of we're the closest biggest town i guess you could say but it's not um the houses are not staying on the market long like they're gone they're just i had a i had one of my realtors tell me the other day that there was a house on the market for 10 hours and there was a hundred thousand dollar escalation clause put on that house like that's just that's crazy how can they move out when housing is so expensive that they can't even get a house. That's, well, it, it, housing is funny. It does two things. One, it prevents people, it, it chases people out. It, and it's chasing millennials south. Where are they going? Well, if, if, you, if you take a look at the migration, a, a great number of them are going to Texas. You know, because you could buy a house in Texas at a, a reasonable price. And, and there's lots and lots of work in Texas. Is there lots of work in the... Um, North Dakota, I don't know. I really don't know. But I, I can tell you this, based on my calculations and the number of people that uh, are going to need houses, we're not a, a two and a half million houses short. We're, we're a 25 million houses short. And by houses, I mean um, structures, you know, everything from it, it could be a mo mobile home to uh, a, a large mansion. We need houses, and and the problem with with that is if people don't have a, a a decent place to live, and or they're paying a lot of money to live, they tend not to have kids, and they tend not to get married. I don't know why that is, but it just is. That's what it is. But we're going to see a dramatic change in that because we are multifamily housing. I don't know whether it, it, it's on fire in North Dakota, but we just completed uh, like 150 pages of a, of, a, of a white paper for a large organization in Massachusetts on multifamily housing. And it is on fire. Absolutely What does multifamily fire. housing consist and, of? Well, it could be something for young people. It's okay. apartment buildings. So I didn't know if it was duplexes, townhouses, and, or if you're looking at multifamily yes, as a, apartment complexes. All, all of the above. One of the neatest things in multifamily housing is uh, um, I just spoke uh, last week to a, a, a group of uh, folks that build retail structure. And you would think, well, everything's online, isn't it? We don't need retail structure. No, no. Retail structure, brick and mortar retail is 80% of the market. Online is 20%. And that particular market retail is, is going to, based on our calculations, is going to double. Retail consumption is going to double. And as it doubles, that 80% uh, brick and mortar retail is going to explode, but it's not going to be the same shopping malls that we understand now. One of the coolest things, and you see it a lot down here, is multifamily housing. We're talking condos or apartments. It can be either one. doesn't really matter. On the, the, the top uh, 10 floors, but the first floor is all retail. I mean, and it's really cool retail. So what they do is they, in essence, build their own city. And it's, uh, it's very exciting. What's happening in the United States right now in housing? Mary Jo, housing is the economy. The economy is housing, period. What happened in, in 2008? You, you know, you can quote me from my video. And that is, in 2008, we had too many houses. We did. Because we had a small generation moving into a lot of houses that, that we didn't need. Now we have too many buyers. Way too many buyers. So you're gonna have you're gonna watch houses fly off the market. You should see what's happening down here in South Florida. I mean, it's it, it, everything every, ridiculous price. Houses that that a few years ago were going for two three hundred thousand dollars are going for a million yeah, and a half. It's not quite that bad up here. But it's pretty bad. So what is so? Let me um, touch yeah. on that just a little bit. If and go back to 08 and 09. So we had a banking crisis. The banks were not lending correctly as well. So can 
if we would merge those two, could I safely say, and maybe you don't know the the answer to this, but we've we have banks that are calling notes and people that can't pay for them because they overbought, but then we didn't have anybody to buy the house when it was for sale because Gen X is too small. Correct. You nailed okay. it. Okay. Gen X All right. is too I just small. wanted to make sure because some people on my podcast are going to go, oh, Ken, you don't know what you're talking about because it was a banking issue. Well, yes, it was a banking issue, but if you put it for sale and there's nobody to buy it, then we have a people issue. Money, money is precipitated by demographics. It's not the other way around. Demographics precipitates money. Yeah, money, mm -hmm. money was invented by people. Money is, is papers, it's electronics on, on, uh, electrons on a computer. No, you need to talk people. And, and when you back up to 2008, that's 14 years ago, 14 years ago, who were the buyers? The buyers were Generation X and Latinos. Well, the, the Latinos that, that had just come in were not capable of, of buying houses yet. And uh, Generation X was too small. Case closed. And so now what do you predict for, you know, I have so many people that listen to this podcast that are buying vacation rentals, real estate, rentals, um, lots of rental stuff. I, based on what you're saying, I'm like, keep buying. Because yeah. we have so we have eighteen year old millennials. If we actually do a twenty year span, eighteen year olds are still millennials, and so we're still going to have this huge influx of people moving out. We're really just kind of in the middle of it right now of these not, kids no, moving out and needing something. You're at the very beginning of it, and it's and, oh. and it, my based on my <laughs> estimation, I'd be I'd be comfortable saying for the next twenty years. We're going to have a real estate issue. Twenty years, easy. Why? Wow. Because you have. Well, first of all, do you know how much money baby boomers control? Baby boomers control about a hundred trillion dollars, based on and that and that's. Uh, um, I think they had like twenty trillion dollars in the stock market, ten trillion dollars in uh, the bank, and seventy trillion dollars in real estate. Well, baby boomers are are aging. Dying is not on their punch list. They want to enjoy their last 20 years of life. Are they going to buy stuff? Are they going to buy homes? Are they, I'll tell you, they're buying homes like crazy down here. You can't believe the stuff that they're buying and building. It's it's off the charts. They're even buying homes We're, here. Can they're not all moving south? Yeah. <laughs> we've no, had no, quite no, a few of the. No. We've had quite a few boomers move from when we. And the only reason I know this is because when we sold our house a year and a half ago we had two or three boomers wanting our home because they're leaving california and they were coming back to the grandkids and so there it's like you would think normally our people are going south why would you want to come to cold weather that doesn't even make sense you go from hot to cold but the, it's in, it's very interesting the dynamics of how COVID switched some of that saying you're not going to tell me that i can't see my grandkids i'll move to the grandkids then changed our values it really did changed our values mm -hmm. and and that's the way it is but you're you're seeing uh baby boomers are consuming uh generation x and latinos latinos are coming of age socioeconomically they're on the bottom rung but they're advancing nicely very nicely uh at buying stuff uh and and then we have uh 40 years of a huge population and i'm telling you the, the uh the rest of the world doesn't have this. You know, we, we just did an analysis on uh, Russia. I mean, Russia's the antithesis. Russia's, if Putin, and literally, you want to hear this? Can I tell you this? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> if Putin didn't attack Ukraine now, in five to seven years, he wouldn't be able to because they don't have enough young men to conscript, conscript into the army. They wouldn't have enough force. He had to do it now, which means that his population doesn't have kids. When you don't have kids, you're cooked. <laughs> which is exactly what, which is what I've heard you say exactly what's happening in China. And so the, again, that's all in other podcasts and I have other stuff I want to talk about, but China is in the exact same situation. The thing that that is interesting about China is because they don't have the workforce and they've basically eliminated all their kids with the one child policy, what do you see happening 
to the U.S. because now China can't produce the goods. So how do you see those businesses and opportunities coming back to the U.S. side? The the I, sp I shared the stage with um, commercial real estate, a, a person that was in the industrial real estate sector, and he said, he said Any, anybody here? I mean, we're, we're talking to a huge trucking audience, and he said, anybody here know of any stuff like and th that I could sell because we don't have enough. What's happening is manufacturing is coming back to the states. Why is it coming back to the states? Because three years ago, China maxed out their their workforce, and now their workforce is shrinking, which means that China's workforce, which for about twenty years worked for twenty five percent of what the rest of the world worked for in terms of value, uh, are now demanding real salaries. Which means that there's that all the cheap stuff that you find in Walmart is going to disappear <laughs> unless it's made here. But what will happen, and, and, and this is, it's wonderful for us, we, we have a population north of us that, that is uh, about uh, 40 million. I mean, you're close to it, uh, uh, Canada. Wonderful people. They, they have some issues up there, and I'm going to be talking to folks from Canada uh, in a couple of weeks about what they need to do to fix their problem. But just to our south, it's called Mexico. Mexico has 100 million people, 100 million, and they have perfect perfect demography what's going to happen is we're going to manufacture stuff here in the states we're going to manufacture stuff in canada but boy are we going to take advantage of mm -hmm. mexico and it's already happening that's interesting 100 million people per, in, in in the um the, the the demographic pyramid in canada pyramids should look like pyramids they should be like this wide on the bottom with kids and very few elderly up top mexico is perfect. So does that, if if that is the case, then does that slow down immigration to the U.S.? No, no I think you're going to, no, I think that the, as the United States prospers and as our, our labor, there are demands on our labor to be, to have critical mass. No, there's going to be plenty of opportunity here. I think we're going to, we're going to continue to see um, uh, millions and millions of of Latinos. Right now, if you look at the United States, this is kind of interesting. There's about 70 million people of, of uh, German descent in the United States. 70 million. A lot of them are in the I'm Midwest. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the, then you have 60 million people of Latino descent or Hispanics. 60 million. And then the next one down is uh, Irish <laughs> at 40 million. Interesting. Those three. Yeah. Hmm. Do you know there's only 4 million people in Ireland and we have 40 million people of <laughs> Irish descent in the United States? Catholics! They had kids! Right? All right. So we are not yeah. going to have necessarily a housing issue, but they're going, it's, we're going to have to have more multifamily to fit them. But eventually, yeah. do you think that, I, I hear a lot about the, the millennials wanting smaller homes they're not going to buy as much stuff and then i hear other people say they're not buying as much stuff because they don't have any place to put it but if they had a place to put it they would buy more stuff that's psychographics and and i would say that's probably true the the millennials what the millennials will do and they'll do essentially what the baby boomers did it was always believed that the uh, the baby boomers would move into metropolitan areas as soon as they had um, their first child maybe even their second and realized that they couldn't educate them in a city they wanted a freestanding house and out they went and they drove that business through the roof the only problem that we have is can we build those structures fast enough? I, I was speaking to, uh, in Oregon, to which is one of the states that's growing, um, ab about logging. To, I was speaking to a logging association. I said, how's it going? And they said, well, we can't cut trees fast enough. And they said, so you're going to have to start building your houses out of concrete and plastic. And well, we we're going to get a lot of it out of concrete. Canada. Like a lot of our lumber already comes out of Canada. And then when when with COVID, like we have seen here, a huge spike. I mean, well, obviously everywhere, but a lot of that was because you couldn't get it out of Canada either. Well, my gosh, we're gonna have to start. Right. We almost will have to start cutting more trees and cutting our own timber if we're gonna have a huge, a huge lack. Or there is gonna be the concrete or the three D printing, 
which 3D printing is not going to hold up in North Dakota. Sorry. You might want to be, you can maybe put one of those houses in the South, but that is not going to work here in North Dakota when it's 60 below. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me see what else I got on my list of things to ask you. Um, oh, how is, you touched on this, the baby boomers having a hundred trillion dollars in the market. What are, what's going to happen to the market when they all start to use that money for retirement? Because if they die with it, it just continues to roll to the next generation. Now the next generation has to spend it on, on the side of what I do that, you know, the government said, oh, you have to take it out within 10 years. You can't just keep rolling it. So they're going to get their taxes. But if we're using it to live and the cost of goods is going up, what happens to the market? Because are the younger people putting money in? I would say no, but that's just what I see. Yeah, I, I, I just think that the, the demography of the United States is so healthy that even as the baby boomers start to die in mass, and, and that won't be for a while yet, maybe... 10 or 15 years, uh, where they'll start dying at, at, at the rate of four or five million people per year, because they're not going to live forever. I mean, they, they're, they're not going to die in their 60s or 70s, but they're probably going to die in their 80s and 90s. Uh, there's going to be an awful lot of consumption that's going to take place in between now and then, and that, and that consumption, when, when you think about people spending money, you have to think about how far does the money go? You know. <clears throat> If you if you if you buy something if you buy from seed to table you know like you described earlier, okay it doesn't go very far, it goes but maybe it does maybe the people that have the farms then spend it someplace else, but I I think the economy of the United States is going to be at levels we don't understand I really do, and I think if we just in and and I think we're right on the verge of it we're watching it. And, and how can I think that in light of the fact that it, it seems like the stock market is stalled right now? I think once we get past this Ukraine thing and once Putin fails, and he will, uh, you, you're going to see so many exciting things happen here in the United States economically. Big time. So I actually asked my clients um, what questions they had for you. And that was one of the questions they had. How does war and stuff that is going on right now, like Ukraine, how does that affect demographics? Well, it's... <laughs> the number of people that you're seeing move right now out of Ukraine, I don't know what the number is now, maybe it's approximating 5 million, is the largest migration of humans in the history of the world. I mean, sudden, because it's, it's just over the period of, of a very, very short time. What's going to happen? Uh, I I really do believe that Putin is going to fail, and I believe he's going to fail because he was destined to fail even before he started, because he just simply does not have the population. You know some things about about Russia. You know half of the men that die in Russia die drunk. The average age of male dies in Russia is 59. 59. Right now, if you looked at their uh, demographic pyramid, they're not, they don't have any kids. They're not getting married, and they are lopsided with middle-aged women. Why? Because their their counterparts are dead. It's a it's a it's in shambles. It so really is. So, what has happened to so, demographics in the past when we've had wars? Did they all did they flee as well their country, and then they never went back? Like if if we have up, upwards of five million people leaving Ukraine and leaving Soviet Union, are those people eventually going to go back when it's all over? The major, or will the majority of them stay wherever they flee to? I think they're probably going to stay, especially if, if they're uh, fleeing into NATO countries and they can see what kind of a life they mm -hmm. can have. But World War II, as, as I understand it, the, the Russians lost about 20 million people in World War II. And I think a lot of that was they did themselves. What did, what did the United States lose? We lost um, uh, four or 500,000 men. And we recovered. We we recovered. Uh, do I think that uh, Russia right now is going to recover from doing this? No, because I think it's a last gasp, a last gasp. <clears throat> There's no leadership left in Russia because it's all been killed. Uh, it's it's a it's a shame. It's really a mess. And uh, I I I believe that we're going to see a level of prosperity that we don't understand, especially here. In, 
uh, in the Americas with, with Canada, United States, Mexico, Central and South America um, once we take care of the crime issues. But I think we're fine. So I really do. You know, one thing I am concerned about for your farmers is, uh, it, it, so I'm told, is a fertilizer oh, going to be hard to get. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yeah. Some, I have a client that actually sells fertilizer. He can't get it. Um, I talked to my my brother the other day, and I think he said that his fertilizer cost went up 150%, which is pretty normal amongst yeah. all my farmers that they're saying that. So we're really having to, you know, there's a whole movement in regenerative agriculture, and I don't care how people farm. I don't care if you put fertilizer and chemical on, whatever you do, that's, that's up to you, it's your farm. Um, but the regenerative egg, the regenerative agriculture movement is saying, hey, we don't need fertilizers, we don't need chemicals, the ground will provide what the ground needs if it is fed correctly. And so I think some of these, it'll be interesting to see what happens when people are put in a position where fertilizer is going up 150%. Are we going to try to eliminate using it? And everything I've heard as well is we can't, like, there. you just don't eliminate using it year one you just don't go oh i can't use fertilizer this year it is a it is a long process to get all the bugs in the ground that need to be yeah. there and so we're going to see the cost of food go up as well i mean i went to walmart yesterday there are three of us in this household and i did not buy anything really out of norm and i get to the checkout and i'm like 140 dollars we left with like five bags of stuff and I said to my husband, what, what did I buy? What, like, what did I, what? And I actually had to look at my receipt, which I do not do very often. <laughs> and I'm like, that is insane. We're already seeing the massive inflation, the massive fuel costs that are affecting everything down the road. And so fertilizer, that's just one of them. The sad part about that is your farmers and ranchers are not gonna be the ones getting the extra money. They get the extra expense of a hundred and fifty dollar or hundred and fifty percent increase, but they are not going to necessarily feel because yeah, okay, corn goes up in price and wheat goes up in price, but it basically breaks them even. It's the it's the Walmarts and the and the General Mills who are going to see that price. Because General Mills is going to charge Walmart more. So it's the processor that's getting all that stuff. It's not necessarily even the farmer, unfortunately. <laughs> So a little lesson for you in farming, but <laughs> but I did have a question for you on the, um, I had a client asking about, we in the farming industry, we are really seeing a lot of China coming in and buying stuff. A lot of other countries coming in and buying up land in the US. Are you, do you see the demographics of, is that any part of demographics that you track or look at? Not really, no, it, it's not. Okay. Right, but I, I'll tell you this, I wouldn't worry about it because China is in such bad shape. Um, I, I don't blame them for investing in us <laughs> instead of them. Well, the crazy thing is, is, you know, a lot of people will say, well, we should be concerned that China's here. And then I listen to other people and they say, well, Ch China's actually like bringing their money and turning it into US dollars and just making our dollar even stronger. So it's not such a big deal. But on that front of it, it would be interesting just to see how much was coming in. Okay, so I wanna go back also to your brick and mortar businesses that you were talking about. So COVID, do you know how many people started the the demographics of how many people are ordering online now versus what they used to be because you're so certain there's going to be brick and mortar and i'm gonna question you because I, <laughs> I know you're the professional but man i see amazon trucks everywhere yeah but they're they're at 20 percent, and and it, it fluctuates 20 25 20 you know it's no, but how the millennials shop? That's how they shop. Yeah, they, that's how I they have shop. a generation. I have two millennials, and I have a generation Z. And the generation Z, well, I look at my Amazon cart, and I'm like, no, 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 you're not buying all that stuff. That no, she's like, mom, I'm not. I was just shopping. I'm like you're shopping? What are you talking about? She's like, well, I'm just shopping. That's how I shop. <laughs> it's crazy. 
They're, the way they do things is so different. <clears throat> what's, com what's coming down the pipe, Mary Jo, is uh, a different kind of retail. And, and a retail that people have to experience. A, peop a, a retail where people have to interact with other people. And a, where a, a retail where people will uh, go do retail as a way of entertainment as well. So don't worry about it. We're fine. No, re retail, <clears throat> retail is very, very strong now, and there's so many new consumers in these, uh, you know, in the millennial group and in the Generation Z group. Retail will be strong till the cows come home. Can I say that? So, yeah, <laughs> you could say that, yes. <laughs> so, so the millennial, if I understand you correctly, the millennial generation is bigger than the generation bigger than Generation X because of immigration. Does Is immigration still continuing to grow that millennial age group? Um, it, it will to a degree. Uh, I don't think as much, you know, the, the, the immigration that gets all the attention is the illegal immigration that's at our southern border. And, and we do have to deal with that. But for for now, uh, when you have 60 million Latinos and they're Catholics and they're, they're in the United States, they're going to grow of their own accord. You won't need additional immigrants. Um, over the next 20, 30 years, you're going to see many, many, many tens of millions more Latinos. But, but then again, do you know how Generation Y is marrying outside of their race and color and, and, and religion at the rate of about 25%? So all of that's going to cease to be an issue. It's just mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. all going to be shades it darker. Okay. It's okay. So do you know by by twenty by twenty forty five will be a um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, there'll be fewer there'll be fewer white people than the rest of the United States. In it's something like 47 percent. In 2045, and it's okay. We are. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, look at how many immigrants. Germans came over here. That's Who it. was complaining about all the Germans then? Now, if we're that yeah. many of them, like we, it's, it. I have a hard right, time right. complaining about legal immigrants because when you're trying to find labor, even up here, when yeah. we just remodeled our house last year, and it's hard to find labor, and. You know, I looked at just the guys that showed up every day were the Latinos. They showed up every day and they worked their butts off. <laughs> and of course they go south in the winter, but I don't really care. You come back up here in the summer and you can build whatever you want. You know, they work. Minority majority. That's what I was, that's the phrase I was oh. seeking to. Minority majority. Yeah. So, and that's what the United States is going to be. And it's okay. Okay. Um, do you have any idea how many kids your these millennials are going to have? Any predictions on that? <laughs> you know, it's funny you should ask because I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if they had three? <laughs> but, <laughs> but but then along came COVID, and COVID did. You know, COVID was supposed to produce some disproportionate number of children. It didn't do it. Really? And right, yeah. And right now, you know, replacement level fertility is two point two. And right now, the United States is at about one six, one seven. Do I think we're okay? I think we're fine, and, and because we're about the same as Russia, but we we have a, where we've started from is so much healthier. So I think uh, I really do think that millennials could have a couple of kids, at least have a couple of kids, and that's all we need, as long as we can continue to do immigration. Do you realize that, that China can't do immigration, Japan can't do immigration, South Korea doesn't do immigration because they're xenophobic; they're afraid of foreigners. We're not. We're not afraid at all. But that's what's going to make us the greater nation at the end of the day, because those it's guys so don't have anything. You know, you know I, I, I speak to large audiences. I was speaking last week to these retailers. There must have had to be 500 people in a room. And I, and I said, how many people here have some Irish descent? Raise your hand. Half the room. Half. And I said, do you realize if, if, the, if I was doing this presentation 100 years ago, and I'm, I'm almost done, and we all went to the bathroom, you folks that raised your hand that said you were Irish couldn't use the same bathroom as me because uh, you weren't considered white. Mm. And I'm thinking, 
Have we gotten past that? Yes, we have. We have gotten past that. It's who we are. It's our strength. Mm -hmm. We're fine. Do you feel that the, or are you seeing that the millennials are more entrepreneurial than us generation yeah. Xers and boomers? Entrepreneurial is a product of not being able to find work. That's when you have your most entrepreneurs. That's when you have people. My wife and I, uh, way back when started a business and we started it because we couldn't find jobs at businesses that we liked, so we created one. That's what entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, uh, people have become entrep entrepreneurs, not because they can find uh, jobs everywhere, because you know where they're the fewest entrepreneurs are in Generation X, why? Because they were always in demand, always, always, always. Boomers, monster entrepreneurs, and Generation uh, Y, because there's so many of them, as soon as the jobs all dry up, and they will, and, you know, that whole labor issue will dry up, you're going to see a whole flood of entrepreneurs. Flood. Very no interesting, because I find I have I have a few, I probably have two to 300 gen, um, millennials as clients, and they are very entrepreneurial. They are hard Good. workers, but they think differently. They are not going to go to work for you and just stay there and be treated like crap. They are going to, they demand to be treated nicely. They are not, they, and they have to work where they're passionate or they just don't. They just move on. They won't, they won't work for mean people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that's, that as well. They just not, they're not, but they want, not, they have the desire to learn and they are not just, they're not just following like my generation, which is X. They're not just following. Like I feel like our generation did, but that totally makes sense because we didn't have a choice. We had, there were jobs. We just worked. Yeah. You have hmm. plenty of jobs. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Um, you, there was something you mentioned that I wanted to touch on. Oh, food in this world of farming and ranching that I am so closely tied to. All we hear is that we are not going to have enough food. Farmers need to produce the way they're producing because we cannot feed the world, not the country. We cannot feed the world at the rate we are. And you say opposite. Well, I, I just say opposite because with supply and demand. I, I don't think market economies shrink from supply and demand issues. And, and, if, and we have 7.7 .7 billion people on the earth right now. And um, all of the data that I see uh, reflects a, a production of food to feed about uh, 14 billion. So we, have, we throw half it away. Is that going to change dramatically? I don't think so. I really don't. And not only that, the United States, I think, will forever be the breadbasket of, of the world because of who we are and how much, you know, uh, the quality of our land, the quality of our rivers, the quality of, of, of what we're struggling with right now is labor. But we have we have all three. I think we're going to be it fine. Was, so this is where I, the I, farming I just, side of it. And the demographics of just farming, like the micro portion of it that you were talking about that you're not doing. But we are, lo the reason farmers are so concerned about it and we talk about it so much in this industry is because we are losing farm ground at a very high rate because cities are expanding. And the more millennials we have building houses, the more farm ground we lose um, and the less food that then gets produced. So they very much on the opposite side, on our side, are talking about how we're not going to have enough food. But if we're, it would be interesting to see that demographics, um, which you obviously don't know because you're not studying the farming side, but it gives me something to look at. Good. But remember, I said this, mm -hmm. we're going to be fine. Relax. Yeah. Don't fall on but I don't have to learn how to can. Is that what you're telling me? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, how if millennials are moving out so late? My gosh, when are Z's gonna move out? When they're forty? <laughs> I don't know. They they could be very they could be very different. The the situation could be very different, and, and I believe it. I believe it will. I mean, the the reason that millennials aren't moving out is because they really can't. 
but they're going to have to. They're, they're just going to have to. They're going to have to face reality, and they're going to have to figure out how mm-hmm. to feed themselves. Okay, now I want now I want to talk about That's some opportunities. Good. This is the most exciting thing. For, I did not sleep for like two nights. I'm not even going to lie. I listened to your podcast that you're on. I listened to the book and I'm like, oh my gosh, because I am very entrepreneurial. Where are the opportunities? We need all the things we're going to need. And so where are you seeing the biggest opportunities for every generation? I mean, boomers to me are kind of obvious, but let's go over boomers. And then is there going to be any kind of opportunity for Gen X because we're so small? I don't know. I really don't. I, I, I'll, I'll, I can just tell you in general the uh, opportunities. Think, think for boomers, the largest generation ever to retire, ever, ever, ever. What will they do? Will they eat out? Will they need clothes? Probably not. Will, will they need some kind of recreation? Yeah, they probably will. So if they just thought that through and, and said, this is the largest generation ever to do what retirees do, how can I get in their path? But I'll tell you this, the body breaks at, at uh, 75 years old. That's that's pretty much when, when things start going south. Baby boomers are currently uh, 58 to 77 years old, which means that everything healthcare, everything, everything, everything healthcare is going to flourish. And I believe that we're going to we're going to find a cure for cancer. I believe we're going to find a cure for heart disease. I believe we're going to find a cure for Alzheimer's. And it's going to be because you have money, mass, and motivation, baby boomers, throwing everything they have at this because they don't have dying on their punch list. So you, you want to, another opportunity? And this is this is something that's really weird. Uh, and, and, and I don't know, maybe you, you'll cut this part. <laughs> but in, in the 1990s, the, there was a famous a demographer whose name also was Ken, not me. And he told the death care industry to get ready because the baby boomer generation was going to start to die in the year 2000. Well, he was about 40 years off, at least 20 years off. So funeral homes, crematoriums, and cemeteries were all bought up by large organizations, and they capitalized like crazy, and then they watched the death rate nosedive, decline. Right now, those three categories, and that is elder care, health care, death care, and, and with the things I mentioned, are so totally underserved that they won't be able to hand, handle the death of the baby boomers. So, I see it. So have I have been telling my husband for two years, like, I need to be an investor in a retirement home because they are going up everywhere in our yes. town. They're everywhere. But now I have seen, yep. and I have I have a couple of clients, and I've talked to a guy in the South that they're taking regular houses, like a ranch style home, and they are making it an elder care facility for three, four residents. And I yes. feel like that is just going to take off and be huge. But then, if our if our Here. boomers and our Gen Xers have the amount of autistic children that we have. They're, they're the caregivers where I think we're also going to see as those pass away, we're also going to see we're going to need some sort of a home care facility for the disabled children as well that have lived at home forever and not been put into a bigger facility. True. Absolutely true. What you do. You see, Readers, you wear glasses, I'm old, right? I'm a Gen X. So. Okay. <laughs> what, you, what you do, you look at populations and you say, where is there a big population? Well, there's a monster population right now that's between the age of uh, 58 and 77, but they already had their glasses. I was in the, uh, the optometric industry di- in a distant way because I, we had a marketing company um, back in the in the eighties, when do people start to wear glasses 40, in mass? Probably forty. Really wear glasses okay. between forty and forty-five. And you know what it's called? It's called presbyopia. It's something that happens to your eyes. It's just I, there's some kind of a name for it. Presbyopia. 
What's going to happen to the eyeglass business? What's going to happen to um, lens crafters? Lens crafters right now is doing a good business. Lens crafters is not going to be able to handle the volume because this monster generation Y is moving into the age where their eyes go south and they're going to need to, to have glasses. Okay, that's number one. Automobiles. Who buys automobiles? Well, the lion's share of automobiles are bought by people 40 to 45. That, that's when you drive the most. You, you're taking the kids to soccer practice, whatever it is. I don't know. 40 to 45. Are we going to sell a lot of cars? This monster group is moving into the age that buys cars. If they move into the age that buys cars, the sale of cars is going to go through the roof. You know, that that's how we... You know, how I learned about this business, remember motorcycles, my Honda motorcycle story? Once the baby boomers exited, buying Japanese so bikes, if we it nosedived. Build, the boomers are going to need care facilities. We're going to need funeral homes. We're going to need crematories. Are we, when the baby boomers move through their, their generation... Are we going to be overbuilt for Gen X? Then what do we do? Are we going to have a huge crisis again when Gen X gets to that position? I don't think so, because I think by that time, socioeconomically, the millions and millions of Latinos that filled in the hole in, in Generation X will be socioeconomically prepared to mm. uh, take up the And slack. then I heard you on a podcast that um, the this younger generation doesn't like cars. Now I myself am a little bit of a car geek. I love old, I love like the hot rod cars. I I just grew up with, you know, your 64 GTOs, and your whatever, like your Mustangs. And so I heard you on a podcast say that this younger generation is not wanting these muscle cars. And so I'm thinking, okay, so we should be buying houses and selling our muscle cars while there's still old people that want muscle cars. It's true. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. I have, I have a, a 1965 Mustang K Coupe, which is a very rare car. And, uh, and I'm wondering, and right now it's worth, I don't know, 50, 60 grand. And I'm wondering if it's going to increase in value or <laughs> is Generator Y going to kill my car? <laughs> yeah, right. It is. We'll see. So we have um, the, we I this is what I find interesting is that my husband and I being Generation X, we love the 60s models muscle cars. But then our son, who is 25, he loves all the square body 80s Chevys you know, your 70 and 80 Chevys, like you can't hardly touch those cars because those millennials are buying those cars up and they want that square body Chevy. <laughs> so it is, it's, it, we're all behind a generation. We always liked what mom and dad had, right? <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, but everybody here drives. Very so, cool. You know, you were talking about how Uber is going to kill yeah. that car industry, but everybody around here drives. So I that we are sheltered from. Okay, I I think I'm out of questions for you. I mean, I'm not out of questions, but I'm not I'm not going to take up <laughs> two kidding? days of your time. I just think that there is so much opportunity, and people really need to be open to see how millennial that. People need to be aware of the fact that there are so many millennials and you either change and adapt and pivot or you're going to be dead in the water um, because they are our next generation and they are the ones that are going to determine what can, if we are entrepreneurs, what do we need to, what do we need to provide for them? And the way they buy things is going to be very, very different than how we bought things. Precisely. Did you ever hear of Yogi Berra? Yeah. Okay. The future ain't what it used to be. That's so be prepared to change. Change, change, change. Don't let it give you a stomach ache, but don't don't be afraid of change because we are going to go through change like crazy. But there is no better place to be than in North America right now. That's awesome. No better place. That's awesome. It is. Okay, I'm gonna, cool? yeah, I'm gonna end on that. Ken, can you tell everybody how they can, how you want them to get the book, how they can get a hold of you? Cause here's, I'm gonna put a plug in for Ken. He does speaking engagements. And so if you 
are somebody that is listening and you have an organization that is bringing speakers in, please contact him for those sort of things as well, not just his book. My my website is the kgcdirect.com, kgcdirect.com. You can get the book, you can read. There's, there's tons of stuff on there. There are, there are newsletters. I just wrote about Putin and I, 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 I can't believe I, I write about Putin and all of a sudden uh, everybody picks up on, on the things that I write about. But I'm sure you've, you've had that happen. Um, yep, absolutely. I, I think Elon Musk steals my stuff. But I, I, <laughs> I'm so flattered that he does. Yeah, so, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if you need anything, you know where to find me, Mary Jo at Without the Bank, and go to farmingwithoutthebank.com. Have a good one.